Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask our, internet, our internal visitors to check that cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy to our speaker. And, of course, our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Michaela Dodge, who is Senior Policy Analyst in our Defense and Strategic Policy for the Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. She specializes in missile defense, nuclear weapons modernization, as well as arms control. She holds a master's degree in Defense and Strategic Studies from Missouri State University. She received a bachelor's degree in International Relation and Defense and Strategic Studies from Maastricht University in the Czech Republic. Please join me in welcoming Michaela Dodge. Michaela. Thank you so much and welcome to Heritage. Uh, first correction, Ambassador Edelman is coming tomorrow, not today. Tomorrow we have an event on cost of nuclear weapons enterprise. So apologies for that. But our speaker is no less exciting and interesting. Um, and his name is Dr. Mark Schneider. Uh, he's a senior analyst at the National Institute for Public Policy. And he works on missile defense, arms control, Russia policy, strategic forces, uh, verification and compliance issues. Uh, prior to joining the NIPP, he served as a member of the Senior Executive Service within the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, and he was Principal Director for Forces Policy, Principal Director for Strategic Defense, Space and Verification Policy, Director of Strategic Arms Control Policy, and many other distinguished positions. He served as a member of the Senior Foreign Service on the State Department Policy Planning Staff, and he was a professional staff of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He has earned two presidential rank awards of meritorious executive in the Senior Executive Service, uh, the Secretary of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Medal, and two Secretary of Defense Meritorious Civilian Service Medals. He has a PhD in history from the University of Southern California and a JD from George Washington University. It's really great um, honor and privilege to have Dr. Schneider back, in, especially in this pertinent time. And I encourage you to develop, um, to, to grab a publication that the NIPP developed um, on foreign nuclear developments, um, a gathering storm. This is a very important publication because we have seen just unprecedented nuclear modernization efforts on the part of U.S. adversaries, while the United States has no comparable efforts. So this will tell you anything and everything you want to know about, about programs of Russia, China, Iran, and other countries. Um, Dr. Schneider, welcome. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, the subject I'm, I'm going to speak about today, I think, uh, is, is very important. Uh, and um, the nuclear threat um, to the United States is very clearly growing. Uh, and um, U.S. deterrent capabilities have been in a uh, serious decline uh, for uh, 25 years. And, and um, that's going to continue uh, for at least the next uh, 15 years. Now, uh, the, the context of um, the nuclear deterrence problem, of, of course, uh, is a situation um, in which a lot of negative things are, are going on uh, around the world, um, some of them uh, directly relevant uh, to um, nuclear deterrence. Uh, in the case of uh, Russia, we, we have uh, uh, them initiating uh, the the first uh, blatant um, military aggression and annexation of territory by force um, in the Ukraine. Um, a number of um, individuals have pointed out that Putin's rationale uh, for defending his uh, actions in, in the Ukraine um, really um, is right out of the Adolf Hitler playbook. Uh, I mean, to, to quote um, uh, Hillary Clinton, um, that what Putin's doing is, quote, what Hitler did back in the 1930s. A and um, 
Leon Aron, who's the uh, director of Russian studies at the American Enterprise uh, Institute, uh, has pointed out that um, Putin's language, uh, quote, is eerily similar um, to that of the early Mussolini and, and Hitler. Uh, Russia is imagined um, as never wrong and uh, perennially wrong by um, the Western democracies. Now, uh, unfortunately, the, the growing threat is, is a lot more than simply Russia. We have a rapidly expanding Chinese military capability with a lot of emphasis on uh, enhancing their nuclear uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, they've just um, basically uh, established uh, a claim uh, to uh, the entire uh, South China Sea including uh, its mineral resources that has no basis under international law. But that's the sort of thing that's going um, on, and it's uh, linked uh, in a significant way uh, to their growth in, the military, in their mil overall military capabilities and in, in their nuclear uh, capabilities. Now, um, a number of, of key uh, NATO officials have pointed out that we face a very real possibility uh, that Putin uh, may um, launch an attack on a um, weak, bordering NATO nation. And as the uh, deputy uh, commander of um, NATO's military forces has pointed out, uh, Lieutenant General Adrian Bradshaw, Sir Adrian Bradshaw, um, he, uh, we, what we could see is a blitz uh, type attack uh, backed by a, a threat of nuclear escalation. And in addition to that, we're seeing a, a load of pressure uh, being exerted um, uh, by Putin uh, against not only NATO's uh, states, um, but um, neutrals like uh, Sweden and, and Finland. Now, Putin has just involved himself in, in the conflict uh, in Syria. One thing I think is completely clear right now, he's not fighting ISIS. He, he's fighting uh, for the uh, Syrian regime, um, uh, the government that used chemical weapons against its uh, own people. Uh, and uh, he is doing so uh, in a uh, very um, uh, brutal manner. Uh, they claim, and, and this is all over their uh, press, um, that they're using precision weapons in an effort to reduce collateral damage. Well, problem is when you take a look at their videos, it's pretty clear um, that most of the weapons they're using are not precision weapons. They're good old-fashioned dumb bombs, and they're using them um, in urban industrial uh, areas. Um, and um, uh, there are reports, and, and I think this is obvious, um, from uh, the videos uh, that there's a very substantial uh, collateral damage. As a matter of fact, in, in the videos that I've, I've looked at, and I've looked at, uh, I think, just about all of the ones they've released, I could, I could see only one of them uh, that, that indicated it was a precision weapon that was being dropped. It was a, you know, apparently a laser-guided bomb. And uh, oh, by the way, the video shows it missing its target. So um, the... Um, Putin has a, it has a record of, of, of brutality going back to the, the Second Chechen War, um, and uh, he is building up Russian military power uh, in a very serious way. Um, and um, that uh, the highest military priority of, of the Russian Federation, as stated um, by their senior generals, is nuclear weapons capability. Now, um, Putin uh, in 2014 uh, announced that he could um, capture uh, five NATO capitals in, in uh, two days um, in a, in a uh, televised uh, call-in where he accepts calls from, allegedly anyway, from uh, the, the, the Russian people. Uh, he declared uh, that uh, he, uh, Russia alone could strangle um, NATO uh, within um, a couple of, uh, uh, within a short period of time. Now, he can't do that without nuclear weapons, and, and that's pretty clear. Uh, NATO has probably 25 or 30 uh, times the economic uh, capability of, of Russia. Um, it certainly doesn't have military uh, capabilities comparable to its economic um, 
uh, uh, situation. But even so, um, he is substantially outclassed, and the only way he could strangle NATO is if he uses nuclear weapons first. And lo and behold, Russia has a nuclear doctrine um, which allows uh, for um, just that sort of thing. And worse than uh, that, um, does anybody, anybody here know um, who actually managed the development of that doctrine? It was Vladimir Putin uh, as then secretary of the Russian National Security Council, and he signed at least the first version of it uh, into law when he was acting president in the year um, 2000. Now, right after that doctrine was adopted, um, Russia started uh, simulating the use of nuclear weapons in, in major regional wars, which Russian press accounts, uh, uh, you know, unanimously uh, state are against um, NATO. Uh, in the uh, Zapad 99 exercise, uh, Zapad means West in, in Russian. Um, the then Russian Defense Minister, Marshal Sergei Ivanov, uh, stated, quote, our army was um, forced to launch nuclear strikes um, first, which enabled it to achieve a breakthrough um, in the theater situation. Uh, in 2009, the um, commander of the um, Russian uh, Strategic Missile Troops, that's the ICBM force, stated, uh, quote, in a conventional war, they, and he's talking about Russian uh, ICBMs, nuclear ICBMs, uh, ensure that the opponent is forced to cease hostilities on advantation, advantageous conditions for Russia by means of single or multiple preventive strikes against the aggressor's most important facilities. Now, this is conventional war, and, and, and uh, strategic nuclear missiles are being uh, fired uh, at um, Russia's opponent. Okay, um, then in the next sentence, he described what a nuclear war is going to be. And he says, um, uh, this involves, uh, quote, an initial massive nuclear missile strike and subsequent multiple and single uh, nuclear uh, missile strikes. Uh, in 2009, Sergei Petrushev, who uh, is the um, um, chief or, or the secretary uh, of the Russian National Security Council, in other words, the head equivalent to our national security advisor, um, said that uh, nuclear weapons could be used, quote, not only in large-scale wars, but also in regional or even uh, a local one. Um, there uh, is also a multiple uh, options provision um, for the use of nuclear weapons depending on the situation and the intention of the uh, potential enemy. Um, General Yuri, or General of the Army, Yuri uh, Balievsky, who uh, was at the time um, the um, chief of the general uh, uh, staff and, and um, uh, principal um, Deputy Defense Minister in 2008 uh, stated uh, that Russia reserves the right for the preventive uh, use of nuclear weapons, and, he, and the threat was literally directed at the entire world. Um, in 2014, um, he um, stated um, that um, Russia had uh, uh, plans for preemptive nuclear strikes and, quote, Con conditions for preemptive nuclear strikes is contained in classified policy documents, unquote. Now, he, uh, he certainly knows what he's talking about because he, at, uh, he was the uh, deputy uh, secretary of the Russian National Security Council staff, and one of his jobs was to update Russian uh, nuclear doctrine in, in uh, a, a publication that came out uh, in, in 2010. Um, now, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, this, uh, this state of affairs was largely ignored in, in the United States. That's changed quite a bit um, in the last uh, 18 months, uh, certainly. Um, uh, both senior U.S. officials and NATO officials have um, uh, stated uh, that um, uh, there is a very serious um, risk associated with um, Russian nuclear doctrine and the possibility of 
Russian first use of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, for example, um, in uh, this year, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter uh, stated, Moscow's nuclear saber rattling raises uh, questions about Russia's uh, commitment um, to strategic stability and causes us to wonder whether they share the profound caution that world leaders in the nuclear age uh, have shown over decades um, to the brandishing of nuclear weapons. Um, Deputy uh, Secretary of uh, Defense Bob Works and then uh, Vice Chairman of the, um, uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral um, Winnefeld, uh, told the House uh, Armed Services Committee this year um, that we face the hard reality uh, that Russia and China are rapidly modernizing uh, their nuclear capable arsenals and North Korea continues to develop um, nuclear weapons um, and the means to deliver them against the continental United States. Now, of course, they didn't mention Iran because, of course, everybody knows that an unsigned piece of paper and a UN resolution that the president of Iran and, the, and their foreign minister have declared they will not comply with will prevent us uh, from being threatened uh, by Iran and, and uh, nuclear weapons. So we, um, we face a, a, a very serious and growing um, nuclear threat at a time when we are doing literally zero um, to modernize um, our nuclear weapons capability uh, anytime uh, soon. The programs that do exist, and I'll get to that in a little bit, are uh, 10, 15 years uh, in the future and only partial at best. Now, um, both uh, Work and, and Winnefeld uh, also uh, observed that Russian nuclear doctrine, uh, they, they actually call the introduction of, of nuclear weapons into a conflict, de-escalation of a conflict. Um, and they assume that it will result in, in a Russian victory. Well, um, our, our two of our top um, defense officials uh, stated in the, in the same testimony um, that this is literally playing with fire, and I, I agree with that completely. Um, so um, we're in a situation where there has been, I think, a significant change both in the um, um, in threat perception in, in the Pentagon uh, and uh, to some degree, a much lesser degree, unfortunately, in, in terms of funding of nuclear deterrent programs. So we have a situation with the, the uh, now confirmed uh, uh, head of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dunford, uh, in his confirmation hearing. Um, said, quote, uh, if you want to talk about a nation that could pose an ex existential threat to the United States, I'd have to point to Russia. General Paul de Selva, who was the, uh, the vice chairman, uh, nominee at the time, in his confirmation hearing, uh, stated uh, that uh, he, would, he would put the threats to this nation in the following order. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and all of the organizations that have grown up around the uh, ideology articulated by al-Qaeda. Uh, NATO's uh, Secretary General uh, Jan uh, uh, Stolenberg uh, this year has described uh, the, the, the current Russian nuclear threat, and he, and he said, quote, Russia's recent use of nuclear rhetoric exercises and operations are deeply troubling. Um, we, uh, as our concerns regarding uh, compliance uh, with the international, uh, excuse me, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, President Putin's admission that he considered putting Russia's nuclear forces on alert while Russia was annexing the Crimea is but one example. Um, Russia has also significantly increased the scale, number, and range of provocative flights by nuclear-capable bombers across much of the globe, uh, from Japan, uh, Japan to Gibraltar, from Crete to uh, California, and from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Russian officials announced plans to have modern nuclear-capable missile systems in Kaliningrad, um, and they uh, claim that Russia uh, has the right to deploy nuclear forces in the Crimea. This will fundamentally change the balance of security in Europe. 
Uh, we learn from the Cold War uh, that when it comes to nuclear weapons, caution, predictability, and, and transparency are vital. Russia's nuclear saber rattling is unjustified, destabilizing, and dangerous. Now, this is re um, remarkable change in policy compared uh, to what existed five years ago when the Obama administration uh, published its, its uh, nuclear um, uh, posture review uh, report which stated, quote, the nature of the U.S.-Russian relationship has changed fundamentally since the days of the Cold War. Russia and the United States are no longer adversaries, and uh, the prospect for military confrontation uh, has declined uh, dramatically, unquote. Um, the good news, I think, is that there are um, um, strong indications uh, that the Obama administration has increased the priority uh, to, to nuclear deterrent forces uh, and has recognized uh, the, the seriousness of the threat uh, that now exists from Russia. Um, the bad news uh, is that the actual programs it's pursuing are essentially the same as those that were adopted um, at the height of uh, illusion about uh, Russian intentions. Um, there will uh, be essentially no modernization um, of um, U.S. Um, nuclear forces since the, the end of the Cold War where uh, all existing programs were either completely canceled or seriously truncated. Um, the, the last um, uh, US B-2 bomber was delivered in, in 1997. Um, and uh, we are now um, talking about modernizing uh, US forces when they are 40 to 80 years of age, uh, which is uh, almost mind-boggling. Um, and um, um, in 15 years, unfortunately, uh, a lot of our nuclear deterrent is going to reach uh, uh, this age bracket. So um, we, we're, we're in a situation where uh, there uh, is uh, great modernization going on in all the uh, uh, states we are, have concern about, and uh, we're talking about a, a long-term modernization that will, uh, at best, start about 2027 and, and uh, between uh, that year and, and, and um, uh, 2031. Um, in reality, right now, the modernization is, is more on paper than anything else. There's only one uh, program that's even under contract, and that's preliminary design work on, on the Trident and, and the, the missile uh, uh, tube portion of the submarine, and that's primarily because of, of the UK um, having to, um, to uh, uh, modernize before the uh, extended life of the Trident submarine uh, gives out. Nothing else uh, right now is, is under contract. In, in theory, what the Obama administration is talking about um, is a uh, a replacement for the Trident's uh, missile submarine in, in 2031, um, a, um, a uh, replacement for the Minuteman uh, ICBM in, in, in uh, 2030, uh, Minuteman 3 ICBM, um, and uh, a new cruise missile, nuclear capable cruise missile, probably about 2027, and a new bomber. The, the official date for that is 2025. Um, but uh, this month, uh, Air Force Magazine, which is published by the Air Force Association, obviously has close contacts in, with the Air Force, says that the real IOC date is, is 2030. So we're talking about things um, that will happen in, in the very long run. Um, the Air Force currently plans 80 to 100 of a long-range strike bomber, a new bomber. Uh, it's primarily a conventional bomber with uh, that can can also carry nuclear weapons. The only nuclear aspect of, of this um, program uh, for the bomber is EMP hard, hardening and, of course, the, the nuclear weapons that will actually um, carry. Um, the, the basic Air Force approach, the so-called family of systems approach, is really a conventional war approach. Um, it's probably not applicable uh, to nuclear deterrence because the other aircraft they would use to support the new bomber uh, are very unlikely uh, to have any um, capability to operate in, in a nuclear environment. 
And the Air Force uh, talks about um, keeping the new bomber in production um, for uh, 25 years, which if you do the math, uh, says they plan three to four bombers a year. So you can have a long uh, buildup after the, the first introduction of, of the aircraft before you get any sort of significant uh, improvement in capability. Uh, the U.S. Um, ballistic missile submarine force will decline to 10, and then temporary, excuse me, to 12, and then temporarily to, to 10 from a Cold War peak of 41 um, submarines. Um, this is being done at a time um, when um, U.S., uh, when the Russians are talking about having made a, a substantial advance in detecting submarines. Now, um, so we, we have very minimal and long-term programs for modernization. Um, the, um, there is no program at this point for a, a Trident uh, uh, missile replacement. Uh, there's an Oceanal uh, IOC date of, of 2042. Uh, but that isn't even a gleam in anybody's eyes at, at this point in time. Now, the, the Russian and Chinese modernization programs, as described even by the Obama administration, um, involve multiple um, uh, missiles for every basic element of, of the trident, of the triad, uh, and uh, in the case of Russia and China, certainly Russia, two new bombers, and, and um, China uh, may actually have three. Um, the announced uh, Russian nuclear modernization programs that are actually going on right now uh, include the following. Um, uh, a new um, road mobile um, and silo-based uh, missile we call the SS-27 uh, ICBM, which is uh, that, that deployment's finished. A MIRV version of the same missile they call the RS-24 uh, or YARS. Um, it, uh, by the way, was tested uh, in the late Star Treaty period in violation of the treaty. Um, a new MIRV um, six warhead SLBM, the Bow of the 30, which is now operational um, on uh, the new Bore class uh, missile submarines, eight of which are going to be uh, uh, built. Um, a new stealthy long range uh, cruise missile designed. Um, uh, to um, uh, go essentially at intercontinental dis distances, the, the range of the missiles uh, 5,000 kilometers, uh, according to the Russians. Um, they are modernizing their existing bombers to <coughs> carry that and to, um, um, uh, to deliver uh, a variety of weapons, including both nuclear and conventional. The Russians are deploying, developing and deploying a brand new heavy ICBM um, with IOC, announced IOC date, depending on who you, uh, you listen to, between 2018 and 2020. Um, they've said it's, it's going to have a 10 uh, ton um, payload, which would uh, give it 10 times the capability of a Minuteman. Uh, and the Russian press reports say it's going to carry uh, 10 heavy or 15 medium uh, nuclear warheads. Now, they've also announced uh, that by uh, 2018 to 2020, uh, they will deploy a new uh, rail mobile uh, ICBM. The, the significance of, of this thing is that the new STAR Treaty doesn't limit uh, these sorts of systems um, because um, the U.S. screwed up the definition of uh, mobile ICBM launcher, uh, doesn't cover rail mobile uh, ICBMs, and there are no limits in the treaty on the number of ICBMs of any type that you can build. So um, we have also uh, an announced program now for a fifth generation um, submarine or submarines. Uh, the strategic version of it uh, is reportedly um, going to carry both ballistic and, and cruise missiles. We don't know what the numbers are that, that they plan. Um, they are developing a new stealthy heavy bomber called the PAC-DA. Um, it's uh, it's going to carry cruise missiles, and there are even reports it will carry hypersonic missiles. 
Um, there is an, an unidentified second type of liquid ICBM under development that was announced by the design bureau that's, that's developing uh, the missile. We don't know anything about this. Uh, my guess is it may be uh, a, a second heavy ICBM that was reported uh, a few years ago and a number of Russian press reports. Uh, if so, it'll be substantially more capable than the, uh, the, the announced SARMAT program. Um, according to Bill uh, Gertz, uh, they're going to build a nuclear-powered drone um, submarine uh, that carries a 5 to 10 megaton nuclear warhead for, for, attack, for attacks ag against uh, coastal cities. Um, that's an amazing development because I can't imagine how you would actually test something like that without risking uh, a Chernobyl-type Chernobyl ex accident if this thing um, gets out of control, which happens sometimes in, in testing of, uh, of drones. And um, the, um, Putin himself has announced that there are a number of new nuclear uh, systems under development that uh, haven't been publicly announced and will be announced at the appropriate time. Oh, also, uh, very recently, uh, they've announced um, that they're going to uh, build 50 new T-160 bombers, a legacy Soviet-era bomber that carries a dozen cruise missiles, and this is apparently is, is a way to exploit the, um, a major loophole that's built in, into the new STAR Treaty, which allows you to have a whole plane load of bombers for, for one nuclear warhead against the 1550 limit. So um, Russia has a very, very extensive, uh, almost Soviet-like uh, modernization program uh, right, going on right now. Uh, their, their main producer of solid fuel missiles um, has announced um, that uh, they're, by, by the end of this year, their production rates are, are going up to 17 percent. So the uh, economic crisis in Russia apparently hasn't affected them in any Anyway, uh, Russia, according to the Obama administration, is now violating um, the INF Treaty, and unfortunately, um, the range of INF Treaty violations appear to be, and I'm saying appear to be because this is actually what's reported in the Russian press, not what the administration says, much broader um, than simply a, a single uh, intermediate range uh, nuclear cruise missile, ground launch cruise missile. So what we may see um, um, is literally uh, a restoration of the uh, Soviet-era intermediate-range um, uh, missile threat on top of a um, Russian advantage in tactical nuclear weapons, which is generally estimated to be about 10 to 1, and much more se serious, I think, than even that. Um, they have retained almost the entire range of um, uh, Cold War types of tactical nuclear weapons while we have essentially abolished everything other uh, than a single uh, tactical type of tactical nuclear bomb um, and um, a, a relatively small number of these um, have um, ha are still deployed in NATO. Uh, according to one U.S. official, the number of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons has gone down 95 percent uh, since the end of the Cold War. So um, we now um, face similar developments in, in, in China. Um, according uh, to the uh, 2015 um, Pentagon report, China, quote, is developing and testing several new classes and variants of offensive missiles, including hypersonic glide vehicles, and continues to modernize its nuclear forces. Um, by in, uh, enhancing its silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles and adding more survivable mobile delivery systems, according uh, to this report. Um, the um, the um, new nuclear ICBMs and SLBMs that are currently being deployed in China include um, uh, two new silo-based uh, versions of, of uh, legacy um, uh, Chinese ICBM, the large uh, DF-5 or CSS-4 in U.S. terminology. Um, one version of it uh, is that now being deployed, according to the report, is MIRV. Uh, the Chinese have deployed rail, uh, road mobile DF-41 and DF, uh, excuse me, DF-31 and DF-31A uh, ICBMs. Uh, that's continuing in the DF-31A category. Um, 
they are deploying the uh, new JL-2 submarine launch ballistic missile on the new Type 094 uh, ballistic missile submarine. They're simultaneously, according to the Pentagon report, um, developing uh, the 096, um, uh, a, apparently a larger um, ballistic missile submarine. Uh, there are reports in the uh, Asian press, including the Hong Kong press, that um, uh, there are uh, there is a at least one type of MERV SLBM under uh, development. It's variously reported as a uh, improvement of the JL2 or a new type, the JL3. Uh, the Chinese are deploying a new nuclear capable bomber, the H6K, which is a dramatically Im improved uh, legacy. Uh, system and it carries, uh, according to Air Force Intelligence, an unclassified Air Force Intelligence report, a new long-range nuclear-capable uh, cruise missiles. So we're seeing the same pattern of, of, of nuclear modernization uh, activities in both uh, Russia and China. These dis are distinguished from what we're doing in that they're actually being done right now. Um, both in, in terms of actual deployments and, and research and development efforts on, on new systems. Um, and uh, there's no indication that any of this is going to stop anytime um, soon. Um, of course, the Obama administration uh, assures us that, you know, we're going to be protected by um, start, um, the new STAR Treaty. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the, um, a couple of days ago, um, a few days ago, the uh, Obama administration uh, released um, the uh, latest data on um, um, Russian and U.S. force numbers um, um, under, as reported under the New Star Treaty. And remember, New Star undercounts uh, uh, a lot of things. Uh, in um, deployed warheads, Russia has moved uh, from. 1537, which was below the New START limit, to 1648, which is well above the New START limit. Um, in deployed delivery vehicles, it went up from 521 to 526. In deployed and non-deployed delivery vehicles, it went from 865 to 877. So in all three categories of systems limited by the New Star Treaty, and we're more than halfway through the reductions period, Every, in every category, the Ru Russia has increased uh, the number of uh, its um, accountable systems. Um, the U.S., uh, just the opposite. U.S. Um, deployed warheads have declined from 1,800 um, uh, to 1,538. Uh, U.S. deployed delivery vehicles are down from 882 to 762. Um, in deployed and non-deployed delivery vehicles, U.S. Has, U.S. forces declined from 1,124 to 898. So um, what's going on right now is very clearly um, one-sided. Um, and the disparities that are reflected um, um, in the, uh, the, the uh, declared numbers, which are based on a, a set of counting rules which undercount a lot of things, um, don't really reflect how much of a disparity uh, has developed and uh, what will likely develop over the, over the next 10 years um, if we continue with the New Star Treaty. Um, the, um, according to uh, Sputnik News, which is uh, the old Russian news agency, Rinovotsi, under a new sexy name, um, the um, Russians um, are actually going to have uh, 2,100 actual deployed strategic nuclear warheads under the new START limits. Um, the uh, Liberal Federation of American Scientists uh, published a report this year uh, which says that the Russian uh, strategic uh, deployed uh, strategic nuclear weapons will go up to about 2,500 by uh, 2025. Um, right now, my guess would be Russia is somewhere between three and 500 warheads ab above the um, uh, the notional the notional numbers that are being reported on the New Start, and um, my guess is that. Um, the Russians now plan uh, approximately 3,000, 3,200 plus um, 
uh, deploy strategic nuclear warheads. In other words, about twice the level um, that um, um, the new START treaty supposedly limits them to. Um, and uh, this is, again, unprecedented. We have, uh, uh, until the Obama administration, uh, we had a constant decline in strategic nuclear capabilities since the end of the Cold War. Now, in the case of, uh, of, of the Russians, the opposite is, is actually happening. Um, the Obama administration has not, has never said publicly how many deployed strategic nuclear warheads it's going to maintain under New START. Uh, my guess is uh, it's certainly not going to be anything like 3,000, and it's very unlikely to be anything uh, close to 2,000. So um, a large disparity in deployed strategic nuclear capability um, is developing. And this is developing at a time when both Russia and, and China are substantially improving their air defense capabilities, um, and Russia both of them have an announced um, strategic missile defense program and actual deployments uh, scheduled. Russia, in particular, is going to do this on a large scale, probably um, 10 times as great um, as the United States' uh, current plans. Now, this is, a, this is a great anomaly because U.S. technology is more advanced than the Russians, but the Russian systems are going to be uh, more capable than ours because they're, they're being designed to defend against U.S. missiles. Uh, where U.S. systems are being designed to, to uh, um, defend against the primitive Third World North Korean type uh, uh, ballistic missiles. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm assured, uh, last time I mentioned this, I, I was told, well, our penetration aids are going to negate all this, this capability. Uh, I asked the uh, individual who, um, who um, suggested that, would he please provide me one official U.S. statement that there are any penetration aids on U.S. Trident missiles, or even a press report? Um, he's never he's never been able to do that, and, and I certainly never have never found one. And I've been following this stuff for many decades. So um, we we have a situation where existing um, U.S. deterrent capabilities are actually eroding, and this will continue. Um, for at least the next 15 years, and, and it won't get wonderful immediately after that uh, because of the slow pace um, of, the, of, of, of U.S. deployments um, that are planned, modernization efforts that are planned um, uh, starting roughly in 2027 and, and uh, through uh, 2031 and, and then continuation of that uh, after those dates. Um, at the same time, we have um, self-inflicted wounds uh, in, in U.S. Uh, deterrent capability. Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, targets um, uh, from a deterrent standpoint are hard and deeply buried targets because not only do they protect nuclear capabilities, uh, but they um, critically uh, protect um, the uh, national uh, leadership uh, in the states that threaten us with, with nuclear weapons. Uh, that's important because um, um, dictators uh, quite usually place a um, very high value on their own skins. Uh, that's for sure. Um, the um, 2013 uh, report uh, of the Obama administration on nuclear targeting uh, said we we're going to maintain a significant uh, counterforce capability. So the first thing uh, they do after um, issuing that report is develop is announce um, effectively that they're eliminating almost all U.S. Uh, bomber capability, and those are the best weapons we have against hard and deeply buried uh, targets. Now, according to a Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense, Elaine Bunn, um, quote. Um, that our strategy, when completed uh, decades from now, um, would result in five types of, uh, of um, warheads designs in place of the um, 12 unique warhead types that are in today's uh, active nuclear uh, stockpile. Now, the ones that are being eliminated, unfortunately, are the ones that have all almost all of our current capability against hard and deeply buried targets, particularly the more, the very deeply buried ones. That includes the uh, B-61 Mod 11 Earth Penetrator, which 
by, by an amazing uh, coincidence, the uh, Clinton administration developed on an uh, uh, expedited basis because we badly needed it against these types of targets. The B-83, which the Obama administration describes as a megaton bomb and hence our, our um, best general purpose weapon against hard and deeply buried targets, uh, and all of the higher um, yield um, versions of the B-61. Uh, they stated publicly uh, that the maximum yield associated with the uh, B-61 Mod 11, that's the life extension version of the B-61, is close to the lowest available maximum yield in, in the B-61 uh, series. So um, at, at a time um, when uh, the Russians are quite um, I mean, quite openly preparing for war against us. I mean, this year they've announced that there are going to be 4,000 uh, military exercises, and 2,000 have already happened, according to uh, the Russian Defense Ministry. Um, we are um, very leisurely uh, developing um, a very long-term modernization plan. Well, how would um, how would I change this? Well. I'd eliminate all of the, I mean, immediately uh, eliminate all of the elements of, um, uh, that are limiting current U.S. Um, nuclear deterrent capability uh, that are based on purely on ideology uh, or, or uh, politics. And um, this, these are the changes that uh, I, would, I would recommend. Um, and none of these, by the way, would... Um, cost any significant amount of money beyond what's already uh, 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 programmed uh, under the uh, Obama uh, modernization programs. Now, the first thing I would do would be to stop the reduction of um, strategic nuclear systems under the New Star Treaty uh, and inform the Russians that unless it terminates its aggression in the Ukraine, the U.S. will withdraw from New Star and reload its uh, strategic nuclear forces up to the Clinton administration levels. Um, I would increase the uh, readiness uh, of our dual capable aircraft, fighter aircraft in, in Europe. Um, that's basically only training uh, and priority. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a big cost driver. Uh, I would accelerate the availability of nuclear capability on the F-35. That probably would even uh, reduce long-term costs, although it probably would have the effect of, uh, well, certainly would have the effect of, of making the expenditures uh, earlier. Um, I would uh, create uh, the uh, UK, the uh, equivalent of the UK substrategic trident, um, which is a low-yield warhead. Um, that uh, the United Kingdom has deployed on its version of the Trident missiles. <clears throat> this would probably cost literally zero um, if it's done as part of the um, uh, program, uh, life extension programs for these weapons. And I would alter the <clears throat> B-61 uh, Ma 12 program um, giving it um, the roughly the maximum yield of, of, of the current available uh, <coughs> B-61 uh, bombs. Now, I, I call these zero or very low cost because um, uh, we're talking about literally uh, zero or, or millions or no more than tens of millions of dollars in, in additional costs, which would, and, and uh, very large benefits in terms of number of, of deployed warheads and, and uh, um, capabilities. Um, the Obama administration has stated um, that uh, it is um, going to uh, provide a, a um, significant reload capability. Um, if they're not lying about that, then uh, reload should uh, be pretty prompt and, and uh, almost, almost zero cost. Um, certainly, um, the substrategic uh, trident, um, and uh, uh, it probably would cost zero if, if done as part of the uh, long-term modernization programs, and and just a very small amount if, if done separately uh, from them. Uh, not only does the UK have this capability, but uh, according to um, uh, 
French press reports, uh, the, uh, the French uh, SLBNs have, have the same sort of uh, capability. Um, the um, increasing the number of, of U.S. Um, deployed strategic nuclear weapons, which is, uh, you know, very low cost, um, will um, reduce the erosion um, of U.S. capabilities due to a active defenses in, in Russia and uh, China. Now, um, the U.S., um, I think, needs more than this. Uh, the Obama administration has talked about responding um, uh, to Russian violation of the INF Treaty. And admittedly, they've been doing this for about a year without actually doing anything. Uh, if, this, if they're serious about this, I think the, the most obvious thing to do is, is a U.S. Uh, nuclear-armed ground-launched cruise missile. Um, and uh, that, can, uh, that can be done probably, um, you know, uh, no more than a few billion dollars in, 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 in ad costs. Uh, and um, uh, it, it would allow us to deploy the same missile on naval vessels. And, and uh, the way I would do this would be to design this system to have both capability to attack uh, land-based targets and naval ships. That would eliminate, I think, one of the most serious um, and dangerous disparities that exist, the fact that uh, the, the Russians can introduce um, uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, into a European conflict, and the only U.S. response uh, uh, into, to most, uh, most types of weapons would be strategic nuclear forces. And that's, I, I, there will be reluctance to do that, uh, and I, I think a, um, at least some um, um, tactical nuclear capability in addition to the, um, um, the uh, dual capable aircraft uh, would be quite useful uh, in, in, in creating a, a perception in Moscow that de-escalation of a conflict through nuclear strikes is probably not a smart thing to do or a very uh, uh, risk-free free thing to do. Well, thank you. Any, any questions? Yes? Um, uh, my name is Cliff Kincaid with Accuracy and Media. I've talked to people who also point with alarm to the Russian anti-ballistic missile systems, the dual-purpose systems. Mm -hmm. And they contend that with that and what you've outlined, uh, how we've been asleep under this illusion, our deterrence value is being questioned, that the Russians may be in a position where they could launch a nuclear first strike on the United States and survive a counter strike. Do you think that's possible? Um, not today, but the, the, certainly the, the long-term trends, um, the combination of U.S. force reductions and uh, Russian deployments uh, go, in, go in that um, direction. And that's one of the, the reasons I recommended reloading our, our, our strategic missiles, because historically um, we have depended on numbers to, to penetrate uh, missile defense systems, and numbers are very important uh, in that. Now, in terms of the, the actual uh, Russian capability, their announced program um, uh, involves the deployment of 10 battalions um, of S-500s, and uh, the Defense Ministry as an organization, and probably about a half dozen senior Russian generals have stated that these are capable of intercepting ICBMs and SLBMs. Uh, and, they're, and they're reportedly nuclear armed, which gives a lot of credibility uh, to that. Now, 10 battalions, if, if, if they're organized uh, in a normal Russian uh, manner, uh, probably is about 10 times the number uh, of interceptor missiles uh, that, we, that we plan. And uh, while they're not likely, they, they never make the, 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 uh, the, their initial deadlines. But um, in any event, no matter when the, the 10 battalions are, 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 are available, that's not going to be the end point uh, in their deployment. It's really going to be more like the relative beginning of what they plan to do. 
Uh, so uh, they haven't announced a long-term um, inventory objective for the S500, but my guess uh, is uh, that it's going to be a lot more than 10, uh, than, than 10 battalions. Um, uh, they will be in a position where they have a mobile system, which is very important, uh, very difficult to suppress anytime you introduce mobility. Um, the um, nuclear uh, option on it, uh, and my guess is they'll probably use uh, very low yield nuclear weapons optimized uh, for missile defense and interception purposes. Um, probably give it a pretty good capability uh, against uh, U.S. ballistic missiles, and if there are no U.S. countermeasures, uh, which uh, I, I have, I have never seen a single uh, official or even a press report saying uh, that there are countermeasures on Trident. Um, these could be very effective. Uh, uh, it is not that difficult anymore to intercept what we call a bare body threat, which is uh, a, a warhead um, without uh, any form of, of, of defense countermeasures. Uh, and uh, you combine uh, substantial reductions in numbers and, and, and the numerical reductions since uh, the year 2000 have been from um, um, roughly 6,000 to under 2,000. Uh, that starts getting very, uh, that's, that's very significant uh, uh, as they begin to deploy significant numbers of these, uh, of these new systems. And again, the S-500 is, is not going to be the last Russian missile defense interceptor by any, any means. Uh, um, they will go from generation to generation as they're doing now and, and even, even did uh, in um, the, um, the battle days uh, of, from their standpoint of, of Yeltsin. Anything else? Yes? Hi, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, my name is Alex Spearman. I'm interning here at Heritage, and I have a question about the Arctic. Um, I know that Russia has been certainly expanding their reach in the Arctic, uh, ostensibly yes. for oil and shipping interests, but I think we know that there's also a military idea behind that. So what role do you think the Arctic plays in Russia's military ambitions and specifically its nuclear program? Well, there, there's, no, there, there's no secret at all about the role the military plays. Uh, they have announced remilitarization uh, of the Arctic on, on a large scale. Um, one of uh, the most noted pro-democracy journalists in, in Russia, and <laughs> there are very few of those, uh, unfortunately, um, Alexander Galtz, uh, has written an article in which he states that uh, Russia equates development of the Arctic with its militarization. And that is what we're seeing right now. They're staging exercises there. Uh, they're redeploying to Soviet-era Arctic bases. They've announced um, the creation of, of entire military units and uh, ground force units, uh, which will be deployed uh, into the Arctic. Uh, they uh, are uh, deploying um, uh, interceptor aircraft um, at Arctic bases, um, including uh, the um, uh, Novaya Zemlya, which is their nuclear weapons test site, uh, and uh, that's going to be the most, not only the most, the only nuclear test site in the world that's going to have a massive air defense uh, capability. Uh, so, I mean, uh, they are they are doing a great deal uh, in the Arctic. Um, I mean, you, all you have to do is, is, is get on um, TASS and, and, and do a search on Arctic. And unfortunately, uh, it's limited to one year. They, they, they do a 1984 cutoff of their, their, their open files. Um, Sputnik News uh, has no limit on, on your search, so you type Arctic into a search engine and you get dozens and dozens and dozens of articles on it. So it's a, actually a fairly easy thing to find out about. Well, thank you so much for coming. And oh, please join you. me in thanking Dr. Schneider.